If you have your Bibles with you tonight, we're turning to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, um, we're going to read a few verses together, uh, thank you for making the effort to come out tonight, there's a crash at the back, if you need to go there, if you have your child and you're getting it hard, uh, don't be afraid to go out, you're more than welcome to use uh, the facilities there. Revelation please in chapter 1, and casting your eye to verse 1, and just before we uh, read tonight, let us just bow together in a moment of prayer please. Father we just bow before thee again and we thank thee for the goodness of God. We thank you for the hymns that we have heard, the hymns that we have sang and the pieces that have been sung to us and we pray Lord as we gather around your word tonight we pray for that deep conscious sense of thy presence. We pray Lord that thou will come and breathe and move in this meeting tonight. We pray, Lord, that thou wilt do what thou alone can do, that thou wilt save and restore, that you will get all of the glory. And Father, I bow before thee just now, and I ask for thy help. Pray, Lord, for that endowment of divine power. Pray that the Spirit of the living God would take this vessel and fill it and use it. And, Lord, that above all, that thy Son will be exalted. We ask it in the Saviour's precious and worthy name. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you know, dear men and women, tonight this whole book of Revelation, it's not a revelation really about prophecy. It's not even really a revelation of the program of God down through the centuries of time. But this book, this last book of the Bible, is a revelation of a person. It says here in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you know, dear men and women, tonight, if you're not saved in this meeting, that's exactly what you need, is a revelation of a person. The Apostle Paul said that it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb to reveal Christ in me. And if you're in this meeting tonight bound by sin and shame and the chains of sin, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ that you need. It says here the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. You know, that's what we've been hearing over the last few Sunday nights, things that God is going to do in the days ahead, and they're going to come to pass very, very shortly. If you cast your eye down to verse number 8, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You see, this message of the gospel tonight that I want to bring to you at the close of this meeting, the message of the gospel is about a man. And if you're ever going to get into heaven, if you're ever going to have your sins forgiven, if you're ever going to be born again by the Spirit of God, you need to have an encounter with a man. It's not money that God's interested in. It's not your morals that God's interested in. God tonight wants to bring you face to face with a man. And every single one of us in this meeting tonight, there's coming a day when we are going to actually see this man. Those of us that are saved, he may come back tonight and before this night is out, we could see him face to face. Shall I behold him? And if you're in this meeting and you're not saved and you die in your sin and you're resurrected and you're brought before that great white throne, judgment seat, you'll see there upon that throne of majesty and purity and authority, there you will see this man, the man Christ Jesus. You remember what Paul said whenever he went down into Antioch, he said that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin. And if you're in this meeting or listening on the CD or internet, and no matter how much sin you have accumulated, no matter how much guilt you have, no matter what your past involves, I want to tell you if you have an encounter with this man, he'll change your life. There is an exalted Son of God that through this man 
is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin. Paul could say that there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. That was the message that Paul preached in the day of Pentecost. That's the message that Philip preached whenever he went down into Samaria. He preached unto them Christ Jesus. That was the message that Paul went into Corinth, that city that was given over to idolatry. He said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. But it's not only the message of the gospel is to do with a man. I want you to get this tonight. The message of the gospel is to do with mercy. Mercy. You know, there's a man and he's crying that very same word tonight almost 2,000 years later. One word in his vocabulary is the word mercy. Mercy. You remember in Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, when the Lord Jesus told of Lazarus, that beggar who died, and whenever he died, the angels came and carried him into Abraham's bosom. And the Lord Jesus also talked about another man. He was a rich man. He was a religious man. He was a self-righteous man. And it says the rich man, he died. And you know, dear friends, tonight in this meeting, I was thinking about it just before I came out through the door. There's coming a day when you will die. Die. That was the epitaph that the Lord Jesus penned over the rich man's life. He died. You could die before this very night is out. This could be the last gospel meeting that you're ever in. And I often think when we stand in the pulpit, who will be the first out of this congregation to die? It says that the rich man died and was buried. And that's what will happen to you and I. They'll have a burial service. The minister will say a few things about us. Say when we were born, when we died. Say a few comments about how we lived our life, but then it goes on. The Lord Jesus said this, that the rich man died and was buried. And, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Those eyes that he used to look upon the things of God's creation, out of the lovely scenery that the hand of God had made, those eyes that he used to maybe look and look at things that he shouldn't have looked at, maybe just the way you are. Those eyes that he used are now, they're lifted up. He lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And the cry that came from his lips, and I say at this very moment as you sit in that seat, the same cry on the lips of that man is mercy. Mercy. That man, I tell you, he was worried more about money in his life but whenever he stepped out into eternity, he was worried about mercy. He spent his whole lifetime gathering up his gold, but he never thought about God. This man, it says that he fared sumptuously every day. He was taken up with food, but he had no faith. He was taken up with wine and time, but whenever he got into eternity, all he wanted was water. No precious wine there. None of your Jack Daniels there. None of your Guinness there. Just to go down into the chasms of a lost eternity. Mercy. Mercy. I want to tell you that the man that we're going to talk about tonight, he has got mercy. He's a merciful one. Through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin. And there's many ways the Lord Jesus has been described in the Bible. He's described as the light of the world. In John's Gospel, chapter, chapter 8, there was a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. And the Pharisees brought the, this woman to the Lord and he, they said, you know, the law commands that this woman should die. And the law didn't command that. The law commanded that the man and the woman should die. But he was nowhere to be seen. He got away. And whenever he, Lord Jesus looked at this woman, you'll remember he said, no man condemns thee, I, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. And this is what he said to a woman that was living in darkness and sin and defilement and immorality. He said, I am the light of the world. And no matter how dark your soul is tonight, 
No matter how far you've gone down into the chasms of sin and the talk of uh, indulgence and the things of this world, I want to tell you that this man is the light of the world. He can shine light into your darkened soul. He's not only described as light, he's described as life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you know, every time the Lord Jesus through the Gospels came in contact with death, death had to go. He's the Prince of Life, the Lord of Life. Down through the Gospels, every time he was confronted with death, he brought life. And if you're in this meeting tonight, again I say, and in your sin, dead and trespasses, and in sin, it's this man that will give you life. Religion will not give you life. Your good works will not give you life. Your turning over a new leaf will not give you life. But the Lord Jesus said, life. He can give you life tonight. He's not only described as light and life, he's described as the Lamb. You remember whenever John was baptizing down in Jordan and the Lord Jesus came the first time that John ever saw him. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And I say to you, sir, tonight in this meeting, with all of your sin behind you, this man not only can take away the sin of the world, but would to God you had grasped this reality tonight that he could take away your sin, even yours. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He's the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. You go through the Gospels and you'll hear something of the words of the Lamb. You go through the, 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 the Psalms and you'll discover something of the work of the Lamb. You go down through even Isaiah and you'll see the wounds of the Lamb. But whenever you get to this book of Revelation, you know what you'll discover? You'll discover something of the worth of the Lamb. Because that's the song that you and I that are saved the moment that we are raptured into the presence of God. You know what we'll sing? Every one of us will be in tune. Every one of us will sing with all of our redeemed soul. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood. The Lamb of God. He's not only described as light and life and Lamb, the Lamb, he's described as the Lord. In this eighth verse, I want you to cast your eye to it again. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord. Now I wonder tonight in this meeting, is he your Lord? I wonder, have you ever come to a, a time in your life when you acknowledge this man as Lord? Because there's coming a day, Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, there's coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess of things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead. And He is Lord. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Now I want you to cast your eye to the middle of verse 8. It says there, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. Saith the Lord which is and which was. Now I want you to think for a moment tonight some things that this man was. Just before we go on, I want you just to stop in your mind's eye. I want you just to pull the brake in your life tonight. and I want you to think with me some things that he was. Because I can tell you there's many things down through the Bible that tells us what the Lord Jesus was. There's a day, many days, seven times in the New Testament that says this, He was moved with compassion over the multitude. He said it says that He was moved with compassion. 
And he saw the multitude scattered as sheep without a shepherd. And this man that we're talking about tonight, the Son of God, the Lamb and the life and the, and the Lord, he was moved with compassion. Something in his heart moved towards humanity. And as he looked out over that multitude, he saw the weary and the wounded and the broken. He saw those that were burdened with sin. And even as he looks into this meeting tonight, I'm sure he's moved. He's moved. Of course, you'll remember whenever he looked out over Jerusalem, it says that he wept. He wept. The Son of God, tears coming down his eyes as he sobbed, as he looked out over Jerusalem and said, Oh, as a hen gathereth her chickens under a wing, I would have gathered ye, but ye would not come unto me. And he wept. I wonder, does he weep over you? He was moved over the multitude. And then, of course, he was moved over a man. Maybe there's a man here tonight. Whenever Bartimaeus, the beggar, was begging at the side of the Jericho Road, the highway, it says that the Lord, when he saw him, was moved with compassion. It says when he saw the leper, that man that was common, degraded with sin and defiled, his, his body was rotten, a picture of sin. It says the Lord was moved with compassion. This is him now. This is the one that you're going to see someday. It says concerning not only the multitude and not only concerning a man, but there was a mother. I wonder is there a mother here? And there was a mother and it says that she was a widow. And all she had was one boy. She was a widow in the city of Nain. And whenever the Lord Jesus was coming into the city, they were coming out. They were going out with the funeral. He had just died that day. And as the Lord, it says, looked upon her, he was moved with compassion. I tell you, dear friends, this man knows all about compassion. He was moved. But I want you to come with me for a moment now. And I want you to think about this. Because the prophet Isaiah says he was despised and rejected of men. I wonder, do you tonight down in your soul despise this man? That word despise, it means to hold with contempt. You know, every step that the Lord Jesus took down here, those 33 and a half blessed years, those sinless, spotless years, the contempt of men was poured upon him. He could say, reproach hath broken my heart. Is that any but wonder he's described as the man of sorrows? He was despised and rejected of men. And you know, dear friend, tonight, sinner in this meeting, the reason why you're still not saved, the reason that you're still on your way to a lost eternity, the reason why the Scripture says that hell from beneath is moving to meet the at thy coming, the reason for it all is this, that you've not only despised this man, but hitherto you've rejected him. The Bible says that he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to be called the sons of God. He was despised. He was moved. The Bible says that he was afflicted. To have that affliction, that word means to be mishandled. I wonder did anybody ever treat you roughly? Well, I want to tell you, dear men, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Lord of glory, I tell you, he knew all about being mishandled. You remember whenever he was out in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he went a little further and he got down and he cried, Father, if it be possible, take this cup away. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And as he was praying, Judas was coming with the lamps and the lanterns and the swords. And whenever Judas came to the light of the world and the Lamb of God, he kissed him. And then it says they bound him. They bound him. 
Whenever they took him into Pilate's judgment hall, they afflicted him. The Bible tells us that they smote him on the face. The Bible says that they plucked the very hairs from his cheeks. The word of God says that Pilate scourged him. I tell you, this man knows all about affliction. This man knows all about the mistreatment and the mishandling of men. I was thinking this morning of what Amalek said to Abraham. This is what he said. Thou hast done things unto me that ought not to be done. Thou hast done things to me that ought not to have been done. And here God manifest in the flesh was the derision of men standing there, defenseless as it were, wouldn't raise his hand. The Bible says when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he threatened, when he was threatened, he suffered not. And you can see the Lamb of God standing before Pilate and all of these soldiers, rough, coarse, ignorant, arrogant men. He was afflicted. But not only was he afflicted, and not only was he despised, I tell you, dear men and women, tonight the Bible says that he was wounded. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Think of all the sin in your life tonight. Think of every lie that you've ever told. Think of every bit of lust and envy and bitterness and unforgiveness that has went through your mind from the day you were born till now. Multiply it a million times over and put it between every one of us tonight. Put all the sin of the world together. And there on the cross of Calvary, he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised. That word bruised is the word to crush. Did you ever see a snail on the footpad? Did you ever see somebody stand on it? Maybe you stood on it by accident. And you hear the crunch. And you know that that animal's dead. Well, I want to tell you, dear men and women, tonight after men had done their worst to him, after men had stripped and scourged and spat upon my blessed Savior, God not only wounded him, but it says it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to crush him. I can't understand that tonight. I can't explain how the God of heaven would ever send his son to a cross of Calvary on my behalf, on yours. And the Bible says, yet it pleased the Lord to crush him. He made his soul an offering for sin. And I'm sure the Lamb of God, as he was on the cross and the pierced his hands and his feet, and in the heat of the noontide day, he could have said to the men and women that passed by, Oh, is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. And the sword of divine justice and divine judgment that was meant for hell deserving rebels and reptile sinners such as you and I tonight. That sword of divine justice and judgment was seized in the very soul of the Son of God. The one who knew no sin. The one who did no sin. The one in whom there was no sin became accountable for mine. And dear sinner in the meeting tonight, as you go on your downward path, down into the chasms of a lost sinner's hell where there's flames and weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, this man was wounded for your transgression. He was bruised and crushed for your iniquity. 
And that's because why God can say tonight to any sinner in this meeting or any sinner in the world, deliver him from going down to the pit, for I have found a ransom. Whenever the God held nothing back, I'm glad he didn't send an angel. I'm glad he didn't send an apostle. But he sent the very darling of his bosom, the one who brought to his soul daily delight, the one who basked in the worship of those angelic beings, came down into this world and they wrapped him in rags, lived in Nazareth for 30 years, stepped out into his ministry and there on the cross of Calvary, made a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. And whether you're a gambler or a murderer or a drunkard or a drug dealer, whether you're religious, whether you're dressed tonight in the rags or robes of religiosity, I want to tell you, if you haven't got this man, if you don't have him as your own Lord and personal Savior, I tell you, dear friends, when you die and you will die, the greatest tragedy known to man will happen. And you'll lose your soul. The Lord Jesus said, What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world? Alexander the Great tried it and he couldn't do it. Hitler tried it, but he fell short. What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And young person in the meeting tonight, you could seek to gain all the pleasures of the world and it's not possible, but let me tell you this, it is possible to lose your soul and you could lose it before the very end of the night. Millions around the world have lost their soul. The Bible says, Who among us shall dwell in the everlasting fire? Who among us tonight in this meeting I wonder who among us on this side or on this side, who among us will go down into the pit? And as you've heard many times before, you may go down into the chasms of hell, unknown to men, unpopular with others, but you'll never go to hell unloved by God. He was wounded. And there on the cross of Calvary, he, the Lamb of God, became a sacrifice for my sin. Would you die for me? Did you wouldn't? And I probably wouldn't even die for you. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And there on the cross of Calvary, in those three hours where the sun forbid to shine, all my sin was laid on him. And he not only became a sacrifice for sin, he became a substitute for my soul. And he became a savior for the individual. What a man. I wonder, do you have this man as your savior tonight? You say to me, Stephen, I'm, I'm a Protestant or a Presbyterian or I'm a Roman Catholic. Let me tell you, dear friends, tonight, there's only two terminologies in the Bible. It's those that are saved and those that are lost. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgressions. But I want you to cast your eye for a moment again to verse 8. Because it says in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is. We saw for a moment tonight what he was. But I want you to come with me now as we, we wrap this meeting up and I want you to see what is he now? What is he at this very moment? Because he was wounded. He's not wounded now. He was despised when he lived in Nazareth. But what is he now? Well, I want you to come with me and I want you to follow a small company of women. Just as it turns from darkness unto dawn. I want you to see them coming and they were probably weeping and they were carrying burdens of spices on their shoulders and they come just in the early hours of the dawn and they come to the little garden 
And as I look at the garden tomb, the same angel sitting upon the stone, and this is what the angel said. He said, Fear ye not, for I know whom ye seek, Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. And I tell you, dear friends, tonight I'm glad as a preacher of the gospel and as a minister of the word, I'm glad that I can offer to you tonight a living Savior, one who rose again from the dead, one who broke the bands of death, that through death he destroyed him who had the power of death. That is the devil. And he rose victorious from the grave, a living Savior. That speaks to me of his authority. My, you can see the Son of God rising from the from the dead. Not a demon in hell could hold him back. The Bible says he spoiled principalities and powers and he made a show of them openly. And my, we love to preach it, you and myself, and Cookstown on a Saturday. We almost said every week, Muhammad's dead. Confucius is dead. Buddha's dead. But this man, thank God tonight, he's alive and he lives in the power of an endless life. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow because of him. Frank Morrison, one of the greatest atheists of a bygone day, set out to disprove Christianity and he knew the one stone that he needed was a resurrection. The Bible says, If Christ be not raised, our faith is in vain. We're yet in our sin. And Frank Morrison wrote a book just called Who Moved the Stone? And he got all of the evidence together and he sat down meticulously to disprove the resurrection because he knew if he could get it there, he would wipe the whole slate clean. And after the fourth chapter in his book, he had to acknowledge that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is undisputable. He went as far as saying that there's more evidence for the resurrection of Christ than there is for the battle of Waterloo. And Frank Morrison, that hardened atheist, got down in his little study with his book before him and he asked this man into his heart and he was born again by the Spirit of God and he was never the same again. I tell you, dear friends, and he can do the very same for you. Ah, oh, you say to me, Stephen, I'm down in the gutter. I'm a drug addict. I'm a, a moral man of... I've lived a life of debauchery and sin. Let me tell you, this man, because he rose again, he can break the power of cancelled sin, no matter how great the chains are, no matter how great the stains are, no matter how great the guilt is and the past is, he can save you tonight in a moment. He's not only a loving Savior, and he is a loving Savior because he loves you. For God so loved the world, And I would love to say it the way God would have us to say it. God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He's not only a loving Savior, he's a lifting Savior. From sinking sand he lifted me. With tender hand he lifted me from shades of night to the plains of light. Oh, bless his name, he lifted me. The psalmist said he brought me up out of an horrible pit and out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock. He established my goings. He put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. But he's not only a loving Savior and he's not only a lifting Savior. Thank God he's a lasting Savior because he's the author of eternal salvation. I see some of you men have some lovely big cars out there. I'm glad I parked mine around the side. But you know, someday your big car will be gone. Someday your big house will be gone. Someday your health will be gone. Someday all of your popularity will be gone. And while all may change, Jesus never. Glory to his name. And I'm glad tonight that I have made this man my Savior because he's not a better Savior. He's not another Savior. He's the only Savior. But is he your Savior? Do you have this man? Has he taken the throne of your heart? 
Have you repented of your sin and crowned him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne? Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. He is not here. He is risen. Very quickly, I'll tell you another thing he is. The writer to the Hebrews said this in Hebrews chapter 7, Wherefore, he is able, able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth. And no matter who you are, I say it again, no matter how stained your soul may be with sin, this man is able to save to the uttermost them that come. He was able to save me. He'll be able to save you. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is not in the business of repairing. The Lord Jesus Christ is not in the business of, of, of refurbishing your life or turning over a new life. God doesn't want to re refurbish your life like some of you men of a Massey 35 and you'll repaint her and you'll restore, but it's still the tractor, it's still the old thing. The Lord Jesus wants to replace, he wants to give you something new. If any man be a Christian, he is a new creature. All things pass away and all things become new. The resurrection of Christ speaks to me of his authority. This verse in Hebrews 7 speaks to me of his sufficiency. I tell you, whatever your need is tonight, whether you need to be restored, he's able to do it. And there's men, clergymen and ministers down through the centuries of time and even tonight across the world they would be willing to save. Muhammad, if he was real, would be willing to save. But he's not able to save. But this man, wherefore he is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by him. He's able to make you a new man. He's able to make you a new woman. On the very seat where you sit tonight with the sword of divine justice and judgment resting upon your soul at this very moment, you could die before we close with the very last hymn. But if you were to say, Lord, I want this man to be my Savior. Lord, I want you to take my sin and my guilt and my past. I want you to save my soul. You know what would happen if you prayed a prayer like that on the very seat where you sit? He would save you like that. You know why? Wherefore, he is able to save. But you know, there's not only the authority of this man, and there's not only the sufficiency of this man. The song of Solomon, my, whenever the bride looked upon her beloved, you know what she said? He is altogether lovely. I tell you, dear men and women, tonight, whenever you have an encounter with him, He'll become the fairest of 10,000 to your soul. I wonder tonight, saint, in this meeting, is he lovely to you? He is altogether lovely. And Peter the Apostle said, he is precious. That speaks to me of his beauty. The beauty of this man. I tell you, dear friends, tonight, if you're saved, he ought to be precious. To think that there on the cross of Calvary, he died for you and me. Wherefore, there he is precious. I want you to cast your eye to come away to the very end of the book of Revelation. And we're coming to chapter 17 and verse 14. Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 19, sorry, and verse 16. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 16. And it says here again, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name which is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I want you to see now this man, the one in all of his beauty and the man in all of his authority, the man in all of his sufficiency. I want you to see him now. See him there as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's him. 
in all of his sovereignty and royalty. And I tell you, dear friends, he's coming back. It says in the wall behind us, surely I come quickly. And the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one which is and the one which was and the one which is to come. I tell you, he's coming back. And I wonder if he came back tonight, I wonder, would you be ready to go? I wonder if you laid your head in the pillow tonight and kissed your wife and your children good night. And the death angel came and your soul was taken and your body became still and slump and lifeless. What venue in eternity would you be destined for? Would you get into heaven because of this man? Or would you go down into the company of those that are mentioned in Luke 16? The man that was taken with his money and gold and food and raiment. And you would join that band of lost souls. And you would cry mercy. Mercy. But mercy is gone forever. You know, whenever, whenever Abraham sent a servant to get a wife for his son Isaac, and the servant came to Rebekah, and he found her, Rebekah's family said to her this question, and with this I finish, Wilt thou go with this man? And Rebecca, you know what she could say? I will go. And you know, dear friends, in the meeting tonight, don't leave this hall without this man as your own and personal Savior. Saul, the king of Israel, he said, I have played the fool. And some of you young people along this side tonight, you're playing the fool with God. And even as I'm preaching tonight, I'm looking into your eyes and there's coming a day when this man that we've been talking about, you're going to see him. And if he goes down to the, the list of names in the Lamb's Book of Life and he, your name's not there, let me tell you, the Bible says, whosoever was not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life was cast into the lake of fire. Wilt thou go with this man? Would to God you would say in the very seat tonight, I will go. We'd love to help you tonight. We'd love to see this matter of your soul's salvation sorted out. You're precious to God. Saviour's died. The blood has been shed. The door has been opened. The provision has been made. Will thou go with this man? Let us pray. Father, as we still our hearts at the end of another day, Lord, it challenges our very soul to think that there may be those in this very meeting tonight heading out to eternity unprepared to meet God. Those, Lord, tonight still under the condemnation and the wrath of the Almighty. Whenever the provision has been made, Whenever the lamb that was slain, whenever this man was wounded and bruised for their iniquities. And we pray for young men and women in this meeting tonight that are playing the fool with God. We pray tonight that thou wilt save. We pray, Lord, even for a young lady tonight, like Rebecca of a bygone day, when the question was put to her soul, wilt thou go with this man? Without any hesitation in her heart, she said, I will go. We pray, Lord, that will be the cry of many in this meeting tonight. And for many up and down the length and breadth of our land, we think of parents in this meeting that have sons and daughters that are wayward. We pray, Lord, that thou wilt draw them to thy son. 
And Father, that he, the man of thy right hand, will get all of the glory. Lord, we're glad that we're saved. Those of us that are children of God, we're glad that we ever had an encounter with this man. We're glad that he ever was moved with compassion as he looked upon us in our sin and iniquity. We're glad, Lord, that he was wounded on our behalf. We're glad, Lord, that he is risen from the dead. We're glad that he is able to save to the uttermost. And Father, we pray as we part one from another, that thou, Lord, would lift our hearts in worship and adoration of this man until the day that we see him face to face. Lord, we ask it in the Saviour's precious and worthy name. Amen.